So speaking of abstractions, dry principle and all of that fun stuff, I want to take a stop to talk about reusability and talk about reusable login. Authentication or logging in is probably like the first time or first function that you write. It may be even the first test that you write. So in here, in this example, I'm showing a test, a basic test that just goes through login, fills in the email, fills in the password, clicks on a button that has the name login, and then asserts that we actually landed on the page or see the welcome message that we should see after we log in. So usually this is something that we need to do all over our test suite, right? So it's only reasonable that we abstract this set of actions. We don't keep that in a test, but we abstract it into its own something. So it only makes sense to abstract it, right? So here's an example of how we can abstract our login sort of in its own module, right? So at the top, we see that we have a, a function that is abstracted into his own login TS file. And then we import that login TS file into our test to be used. So we log into our page and this way we can use the login at every single test that we have. It only makes sense. Uh, there's another approach of how you can uh, choose to make abstractions. We mentioned that, right? Page object model the pattern of for, of for testing. We abstract every page into its own model. I know I haven't done the best job of creating a page object model right here because it's I didn't abstract the, the selectors and whatnot, but it may look something like that. We basically abstract the logic and move on. We then use, our, uh, use that page object in our test. So here we are. All right. But I want to talk about a different approach because while these abstractions are really great for uh, not repeating ourselves in the code, they're not really doing a very good job of not repeating themselves in the test execution, right? So let's say you have 100 tests. Even though your function is abstracted in its own file, we are still doing the login sequence, the fill in the email and password and confirm that and redirect to the page. We do that 100 times for 100 tests, which is, let's say, not the best way to approach that. And why is that? Uh, well, we have to do that uh, in most of the tools, at least, uh, because in between tests or in between specs or whatever the logic is, usually the test framework, Playwright in this case, will wipe out all of the cookies and local storage and all of the data uh, of the browser, which is a good thing, right? We want to have our test isolated, but that also means we need to somehow log in in every test. Instead of going through the login sequence, what we can do is we can take a snapshot of the browser, of all of the cookies and everything, and just log in once, and then reuse that logged in session for all of our 100 tests. So for example, if we have 100 tests, instead of doing the login sequence 100 times, we're just going to do it once. So here's an example of how that can work, right? Here is a, sorry, let's go back. Here's a storage stage function. That's the line number nine, where we do the page context. We store the storage state into a file that's called auth.json. So that's the way of how we can take that browser data, save it on the side, and then use it in our test. So on line three here, test use storage state, would be to take that file, put it in our browser, and now we just go to login, we get redirected by the app because, hey, you are already logged in. Go to the welcome page. And we see on line seven, welcome Philip is going to be visible. This test should be passing if everything is done correctly. One thing though, since usually storing that data in a file, in a JSON file contains some sensitive data or might, uh, contain some sensitive data, you really need to remember to put that file into your git ignore. Don't commit that. You don't want to, uh, that to live in your repo, even less if you're at an open source company, you don't want to, and your code base is visible, you don't want to be sharing your API keys or something like that in the, with the world. Um, all right. So Let's talk about a little bit uh, on how how is this even possible? Like how do we how do we do that? A simple login. There are 
different ways of complexity of how logging is done, but a simple, simplest form of logging works something like this. We have our browser that will load our application, our front end. We have the uh, we have the server that communicates with our front end. So all of those API requests are done between the front end and the server. And when we are doing a login, what we're doing, we're making a call to the server. That server will ask, all right, are these valid? Uh, uh, is this a valid combination of login and password? And if yes, server is going to respond. It's going to respond with a cookie, right? So do you want to allow cookies? Usually you do. And uh, even if you don't, these kind of cookies will be always allowed. Server login cookies, those you really want to have. So where are those stored? They are stored in a browser. And once we interact with our application in the browser, that cookie will get sent pretty much with every request to make sure that the uh, data that you're requesting, whether it's some to-do list or some assets or whatever that you can access those. So server will always validate that, make sure that it is, uh, that you are able to do that. Those cookies are actually the thing that is important. That is the thing that we want to make sure that lives inside a browser. So the whole spiel of the use storage state is pretty much having a browser that has that authentication inside. This is the same principle that front-end applications use when you are when you open your Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and you are logged in, even though you have shut down your computer and turned it back on. That browser has those cookies stored. So page will now communicate with the server. Oh, hey, it's you. You're logged in. And voila. And we can use that same principle for our tests. All right. And by the way, the same thing goes for our for our cookie consent message, right? I just mentioned that uh, very briefly, but if you see those cookie banners appear and they actually inhibit your tests, instead of doing some if else logic in your test, what you can do is you can store the settings of that cookie consent message, uh, which should not appear if you have accepted everything or have set up your, uh, your settings and use that same logic for your tests. Now, if you want to take it a little bit further, you don't want to, of course, uh, do the login for, for every test and store the, store the data in each and every test, right? That would not really be the, uh, the way to go. The way to go for Playwright, actually Playwright team has been smart enough to do a really good job of making, of, uh, making the functionality of test setup available for you. So in this example, I have created a test that is actually called a setup. I'm importing the test functionality as a setup. So I'm calling it setup, although technically it's still a test, but I'm, I'm saving it in a file called auth setup.ts. Now, when I do that, when I do that separate, uh, separate test file, I'm not going to treat it as a test file. I'm going to treat it as a setup file. And I'm going to create a setup project for that file. So here in my configuration, uh, besides my Chromium and Firefox and Safari and whatnot, I'm adding a setup project, which is going to match all of the tests, all of the files that are called .setup.ts. And in my Chromium test, I'm going to use the storage state and use setup as the dependency. So before I run my Chromium files, all of my setup files will get run. So I do my login, I do my cookie consent setup, I do my whatever I need, and only then uh, my Chromium tests are going to, to run. And this is really sweet and really nice way of approaching your testing because you don't have to repeat the execution of the critical steps, you only do those once. One little note there. So if you're using UI mode and you want to try this out, uh, you might get surprised, at least I was when I first tried this out. I tried the, uh, I, I created my setup, I ran my test and it was still logging in. Like, what the hell? Uh, so in your UI test, you actually need to check off that uh, setup project because by default it is not checked in. And if you have a case where you actually don't want to have that login, 
then you can approach it uh, as you see on the picture on the right, where you have a test use. You use the storage stage, you pretty much reset that, you delete all of the cookies and everything. And in your test, you will now be logged in. So even though you have that set up, it will be ignored in this particular test. But then with every other, other test, it will be back on. So really handling some edge cases uh, then uh, and there and uh, and you're good to go. <laughs> really good question in the uh, uh, Q&A here about uh, does the fixture run before all the other test hooks? And the answer is no. A fixture, you just call it when you want to call it within your test. But yeah, this is an example, right? The setup hook, or maybe not correctly defined as a hook. Stefan may come and wrap my knuckles there for calling it a hook. But yeah, the, the setup step will run before. I think it's fair to call it a hook. I would call it a hook. Yeah, it's, so it's a, it's a as would I. Test. But I, I'm not the playwright ambassador here, so you know I want to I want to uh, <laughs> uh, allow that they may have a different terminology, <laughs> right? So, but um, uh, uh, great question, Johanna Joseph. That's a great question. We'll actually get to that in just a little bit. This question about uh, you're using CI to run your tests, but your environments are behind a VPN. And then is there any other way to use the storage state uh, as uh, a Hamed, which is the page instance should come from the browser's context, which contains the storage state. Is there any other way to use the storage state? I don't know the answer to that one. I gave one example, which was the annoying little cookie messages that we get on, on sites as well. So anything that sets the, uh, that is saved in the, in the storage state and you need to either avoid or set up in your test, the the storage state is really great for that another good example for that might be feature flags right yeah usually you have some server communication of course but then that's that setting is saved to your browser so that the user that gets the a version of the site will have the a version of the site the user that gets b version of the site gets b version on the side of the site and it's all stored locally in in users 